nak karwanu hmm. karwanu hmm. This meeting is being recorded. Please unmute yourself. Uh, sorry, sir. Uh, I Am I am I audible? Yes, yes. now you are audible. Uh, so, uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the different case-based spine condition and interventions. Uh, dear and respected guests, eminent speakers, panelists, moderators, and all fraternity orthopods, teachers, seniors, and colleagues. On behalf of Baroda Orthopedic Association, I, Dr. Alpesh Parekh, Secretary, would invite you all for this academic feast. But before we start. let me share a sad news that one of our respected teachers dr golwala sir his wife has passed today morning so i request all members to just observe a one minute silence please Ashit bhai, should I start? Please unmute yourself, Ashit bhai. Yeah, we can start. Yeah, sure. Uh, we all know that nothing is more precious and valuable than our life. And frankly speaking, there won't be any better time than this pandemic that has taught us more than one daily lesson to how to live a happy life and a simple life. So, friends, wishing all a very happy new year, full of cheer. wonder and happy healthy and life with family and friends now may i take the privilege to introduce the moderator today dr ravish patel spine surgeon associated with global sunshine hospital and many other corporate hospitals in baroda to take over the baton and proceed further ravish over to you thank you okay thank you thank you for a warm introduction good morning everybody i welcome you all to baroda orthopedic associations webinar on newer updates in spine surgery today we have a team of young but experienced spine surgeons from all across the country who will enlighten us about the newer techniques concepts understanding and share with us the modern management of various spine disorders so let me introduce first talk uh, will be given by dr varun agrawal who is an orthopedic surgeon from bareilly up He did his spine fellowship from Austria, Switzerland, and Mumbai, and has worked in AIMS Trauma Unit. He is one of the pioneer of navigation-guided spine surgery, minimal invasive spine surgery, and disc replacement surgery in Rohilkhand region. He has established India's first OM 3D navigation equipped ortho ortho spine center in Bareilly, and uh, so it will be really interesting to listen to him today. uh for, we also have dr ayush sharma who is a uh, chief spine surgeon at central railway hospital in mumbai he is trained from indian spine injury center delhi and did his fellowships from germany athens and uh, uk our dear friend ayush is also a recipient of academic excellence award by bombay orthopedic society and sicot foundation scholarship award his key interest include minimal invasive spine surgery and he has done tremendous work on anterior and lateral interbody fusion 
Uh, we also have with us Dr. Bhushan Khedkar, who is our endoscopic spine specialist. He is a national board certified as orthopedic spine surgeon, and he is practicing at Ruby Hall Clinic in Pune. He is trained in endoscopic spine surgery from a world famous Guridul Spine Center in South Korea. His uh, special interest is in degenerative spinal disorders, and he has done more than 500 endoscopic spine surgeries. So it will be really interesting. to learn pulse of endoscopy from dr bhushan and also from baroda we have our own national faculty dr kedar patke who is a consultant spine surgeon at narayan spine hospital he is also trained from indian spine injury center delhi and he did his fellowships from us denmark and endoscopic spine surgery fellowship from korea he is active reviewer of many reputed journals and his special interests include deformity and degenerative spine disorders so every new technique needs to be ev evaluated with wisdom and wisdom comes only with experience so in order to guide us we have our own orthopedic maestro dr ashish mehta dr ashish mehta is considered to be an all rounder in orthopedics and his spectrum of surgery ranges from complex trauma replacement deformity correction and all the way to complex spine surgeries he has a humongous experience of 35 years and he is certainly one of the leader of orthopedics and mentor of many orthopedic surgeons in baroda he is also the past president of gujarat orthopedic association baroda orthopedic association and held important post at national and state level organizations so i am sure that all speakers will have to face tough questions today from dr ashish mehta sir i'm out man <laughs> out okay thank you thank you certainly we have a very well well balanced team today so without wasting much time let me invite our first speaker dr varun agrawal to share his screen and case with us over to you dr varun so uh, good morning everybody uh, happy good morning from uh, jim corbett actually you can see the good view uh, beside me so thanks uh, everybody from baroda orthopedic association dr ravish dr ashit dr alpesh for inviting me for this talk Uh, i'll be starting my screen share now uh, just give me a uh, second so i hope uh, everybody can see my screen and i can proceed now yes yeah so before i start my talk there is a uh, short poll uh, that have you ever operated on Uh, any same pathology anatomy or case and i know everybody would be answering no to this and if you go to a new place do you use a gps for directions or pre travel planning i am sure everybody must have gps on their phones so this is one uh, chat uh, screenshot from a chat with my friend who had invited me for a conference for a talk in lucknow and i asked him what is the venue and he also said please check google and i am also coming by google so with this background let me start so what is oam and navigation so this is what we keep on hearing every time who needs navigation it is very expensive it will slow me down i am doing fine i am doing my spine surgeries i am fixing the spine doing all the cases without navigation and it is just a marketing ploy and it is good for new surgeons so this is how the man has evolved over a period of time and this is how the spine surgeons are evolving that was then uh, we can all remember that uh, uh, my father used to tell me that i used to study in candle night we have now light everywhere then simple floppy disk with around 5 12 kb now we have gbs of storage simple phones now have uh, changed into these smartphones where you can have everything on your mobile device so this is also how we used to do surgery we use the uh, 2d fluoroscopy the c arm for placement of the screws now we are using the navigated 3 arm Uh, 3D CM for this uh, purpose. The radiation exposure for there for navigated steps. Now there is no radiation exposure to us. The operating team. We used to wear so many lead aprons, heavy lead apron. The entire team. Now we don't uh, wear it anymore. And we were always guessing and hoping that the screws are in the right place in the right uh, pedicle and not breaching anywhere. But now we can confirm it intraoperatively. I'll be discussing all these in detail. so this is the magnitude of spine problem today 80% of the population and we can all agree that most of our opd is filled up with uh, 
patients who are complaining something or the other about their back. It is becoming a big industry and the spine surgery is not without its complications including death. So this is how spine surgery has increased over a period of time and the cost and the revenue has also increased. So this is what traditional spine surgery used to look uh, like. Big open wounds, large unlikely, unsightly scars. But now everyone wants this. They want a small scar on their body. They want to go home the next day. So why MIS? What is, uh, this is minimally invasive spine surgery. Why are we bothered about this? So this is the new definition of the minimally invasive spine surgery by the AO Spine MIS Task Force. It is a suite of technology dependent techniques and procedures that reduces local operative tissue damage and systemic surgical stress enabling earlier return to function and striving for better outcomes than traditional techniques. So this is how AO Spine is now describing MIS surgery. And this is the main muscle we are worried about, which is the posterior multifidus muscle. It is a paraspinal muscle and it is the major posterior stabilizing muscle and it is mainly responsible for the dynamic stability of the lumbar spine. And it is this muscle which gets uh, damaged during the traditional spine surgery, during dissection, where it is uh, the stripping of tenderness attachments from the posterior elements of the spine is there. Extensive use of electrocautery causes localized thermal injury to this muscle. There is denervation of this muscle and most significant factor is the muscle injury because of powerful self-retaining uh, retractors which is putting pressure over these muscles. So with the MIS, this all uh, multifidus muscle gets preserved. That We use a minimally invasive table-mounted tubular retractors which produce lower retractor pressure. And there is no stripping of this from the spinous process. So in this paper, in the five-year outcomes, uh, comparing minimally invasive versus open, there was additional benefit of less initial post-operative pain, less blood loss and earlier rehabilitation and shorter hospitalization. So again, these papers talk the same thing. There is a decreased incidence of surgical site infection, decrease in direct hospital cost and direct cost saving with these minimally invasive techniques. And there is lower blood loss to the patient. So why do we use navigation and what is it all about? So this is how this traditional spine surgery works, that you expose the entire spine, identify the predefined landmarks, compare it to your anatomy books, or you may use the intraoperative fluoroscope or the C-arm to supplement your anatomical exposure. And this is one chart which all the spine surgeons have always marked up. So what are the entry points? What are the angulations? How we are to put the screw in the pedicle of that vertebra? But even with all this, there is as high as 23% perforation rate. And realistically, we should be asking ourselves how many have we revised in our career. So accuracy of the uh, pedicular screw, a cortical breach of more than 4 mm is significantly higher risk of neuro neurovascular damage. This has been proved in various studies. And value in healthcare, we should uh, measure with quality or price or should we consider the outcome or the cost involved. So the measure of value is relative. So the cost of navigation may be in eight figures. Cost of revision may be in thousands to lakhs depending upon your setup. But the damage to your reputation, you can't put a price to that. So with OAM and navigation, we are reaching uh, almost up to 100% accuracy and safety. So this is how MIS looks like. There is no direct view to the surgical field. There is no tactile feedback, no visual feedback of the anatomy. The anatomy is not uh, exposed and you are repeatedly using your CM or fluoroscopy. And this improved accuracy now comes at the cost of intraoperative radiation exposure to ourselves, our patients and the operating room staff. And this radiation can be as high as 50 millisieverts. And this navigation now is like our PPE. It is protecting us and uh, I'll show you how. So all these papers, they talk about what is the damaging effect of radiation exposure to the average orthopedic surgeon and more so to the spine surgeon. So radiation, it, it is the big deal. The radiation hazards, infertility, uh, your chances are more than 11% than the general population. And then cataract, around 60% chances, cancer, hematological, mm -hmm. thyroid, all these are much more in a minimally invasive spine surgeon. 
and this has been categorized as weapons of mass destruction the siam in the operating theater so with navigation it is almost zero the operating time is same or even less and the safety is much more so but what is this navigation all about so it consists of an oam system and a navigation system called the self station so oam is a mobile x ray system designed for use in spine cranial orthopedic and trauma it is like a ct scan right in your operating th uh, theater which gives you both 3d and axial images as well so this has a breakable gantry which can open up and you can see you can take the images in the 2d in the 3d and as well as the axial you can get uh, right in the operating uh, theater itself then there is the navigation computer which gives you real time feedback on uh, uh, where your uh, hardware is going where your screws are being placed and then it can be taken out of the or because it is a mobile system so this is the quality of the images which we can see which we get on the table and you can see it is much more superior to any cm and then after our surgery we can just uh, do again a spin and see whether the hardware has been accurately placed so if there is any problem we can just revise it uh, in the theater itself and not bring back the patient on subsequent days so this is one of the the biggest advantage that we can intraoperatively verify where we have placed our hardware so it gives us fast access to real time multiplane 3d and 2d images there is a unique workflow for spinal procedures there is minimized radiation for the surgical staff and there is visual confirmation of the hardware after it has been placed we can do that so what is navigation there is a navigation system with a monitor there and a localizing camera which uh, tracks the instruments the software for it a patient reference frame which is attached to the patient these are the instruments which have the trackers attached on to them so these navigation system provides information to guide the surgical planning and approach they do this by creating a 3d map between the patient and the images of the patient tracking of the position of the patient and the surgical instrument happens in real time and it gets displaced so these are the instruments with the markers mounted on them and even we have these jamshedi needles which can be tracked and there is a uh, tracking uh, markers placed on them then we have the dilators and even the midas bar is now uh, navigated uh, navigated that is available with us and this is the optical camera which tracks the instruments and uh, the patient and then uh, using infrared light and then we can uh, see how it works so coming on to some cases now which will give you a more better idea so where does it work so this is a case of mine a 43 year old male presented with a pain in the back radiation to both the lower limbs with slr 30 degrees walking distance just 40 meters and you can see there is a, a listhesis there at l4 l5 and a broad based disc again so this is how we work we use the metronic quadrant system or uh, the microscope and this is the oam you can see that the gantry is now opening up the patient has been made prone on a radio lucent table and then this system that is brought in around the patient and then it is closed and the scan of the patient is taken and it is just like a ct scan inside the ot where you can get the 3d as well as the axial Uh, cuts of the anatomy and then after that uh, the job is done and we can remove the machine and then proceed with surgery and then this data is fed into the navigation computer you can see that the oam is uh, standing behind me it is not in the surgical field anymore and you can see how real time we can uh, be highly accurate in placing our screws and uh, instruments and uh, and uh, real time it is all visible to us and even the axial image is there so we can be pretty sure where we are putting these instruments so we have these navigable screws now you can exactly see where they are being placed even this midas you can see the bony decompression we can be highly accurately we can make out where we are doing this decompression even the bar is getting tracked and displayed on the computer and then after that we can put these navigator dilators and then 
uh, through the retractor we can even have these navigated cages so we are exactly sure where these cages are being put and there is uh, no breaching or and uh, no putting it on the nerves so this is how it looks like and you can see with just uh, this gentleman with incisions this is how he has been fixed with incisions less than 16 mm and walking the next day and he has been discharged with just small scars on his body so this is another case of mine a 72 year old male with pain in the back radiation to bilateral lower limb with the slr 10 degrees walking distance just 20 meters he had undergone ozone therapy at the pain management center and uh, there was fulminant discitis at that point so biopsy was sterile so it was maybe just chemical discitis there you can see it here so this is how we approach this patient and we can even drape this o arm and uh, uh, keep it in the uh, surgical field and for this case i did an anterior surgery so we can just uh, do these uh, small mini incisions on the abdomen and dr ayush should be talking it about a little more you can put the dilators as you can see and through those we can just uh, you know decompress and uh, uh, debride and then we i put the cage and then uh, with this navigation guided uh, technique and then again uh, made the patient prone and put the screws there and this is how he has been fixed and you can see good fusion and just small scars uh, on the body even the anterior less than uh, around uh, 18 mm scar so another case a trauma case of 45 year old male presented with a fall of heavy object over the neck and back 10 days back with inability to move both the lower limbs and there was a compression fracture of the l1 vertebra as well as a unifacetal dis dislocation of uh, the c6 over c7 vertebra so you can see the ct and uh, you can see the unifacetal dislocation as well as the l1 compression fracture with there is a retropulsion of the uh, posterior fragment there so again on the mri it is all visible there how the nerves are getting compressed so these are the traditional treatment options in front of us for the cervical we could do an acdf for a posterior reduction and stabilization with wiring or screws and for the lumbar posterior decompression with pedicle screws and rods or an anterior corpectomy but can we do all in this case at once using mis techniques so yes these days we can so this is how i fix this and uh, this is placement of the cervical pedicle screw Uh, using navigation technique we can be very sure so as uh, uh, everybody knows placing a cervical pedicle is a very challenging task with the vertebral artery and the spinal cord uh, just nearby and you can see how accurately we can place these and this is how he was fixed all mis and just small scars and the job was done and this patient recovered quite well you can see on the sec by second post op day he started moving his hands and by test uh, 10th post op day itself he was able to walk and the, by two months this was his recovery level and uh, he is doing quite well so this is another case uh, we can use these techniques in deformity also this is a 14 year old girl with the congenital scoliosis presented to me the d9 and d10 were fused anteriorly and d2 to d8 were all fused posteriorly so how do we go about correcting this traditionally do we require a vcr in this and everybody who knows about these kind of techniques know how big a challenge a vcr is and the amount of blood loss and all that which is needed and even an anterior surgery is a big job where uh, so many vertebrals are fused anteriorly and uh, sometimes we need to do these cases in two sittings but using these navigation techniques so this is how we did so this is a navigated guided tap which is being placed you can see even in challenging anatomy how accurately you can put the screws uh, etc this is a navigation guided screw so we have all these in, uh, instruments with na uh, navigation and this is a navigation guided osteotome which i am using to accurately just i pass this osteotome uh, above the pedicle so that the pedicle is not damaged and i can uh, use that for screw and you can see how accurately and safely i just pass this osteotome from the posterior side and did uh, the osteotomy uh, anterior osteotomy also from the posterior side so this is how it has been done uh, a 
the osteotome has been passed just superior to the pedicle and then dropped and then the uh, anterior bony cortex was cracked so this has been described by dr su and this is how i fixed uh, uh, this uh, patient and you can see a, an excellent correction has been there and all surgery done posteriorly and with uh, high safety so this is another case a post tubercular kyphosis 12 year old male and you can see the high degree of kyphosis almost 120 degree again navigation uh, and this was a case done elsewhere and i had to revise it the kyphosis had increased and this is how he was fixed there and a vcr was done and the uh, screws were placed right up to c7 and all pedicle screws and this is how he was fixed and he is doing very well now so for severe and rigid neuromuscular uh, scoliosis anterior procedure may deteriorate the pulmonary function pvcr might result in massive bleeding and this is our aim to have a safe less invasive non technically demanding cost effective and scientifically validated surgery for correction and it has to be safe for the patient also and all these goals we can achieve uh, by using navigation and we are using these navigated jamshedi needles we can use for kyphoplasty kind of procedures as well so this is another case i had one toyed fracture a 12 year old male with history of fall while climbing a tree he had complete quadriplegia at time of uh, presentation you can see here how the cord is getting compressed and when i did the ct i found that the pedicles and uh, all the bones were very thin just 2.3 mm pedicles the screws are available commercially start from 3.5 to 4 mm so we couldn't even put a trans articular screw from all those traditional techniques were very difficult to achieve due to the small size of the bones and this is how he was fixed using these uh, navigation techniques with the anterior trans articular screw where enough bone we could safely have for the screw uh, purchase and by 12th post operative day you can see the patient is recovering quite well so there another case of an occipital cervical anomaly an 80 year old male 8 months old at presentation again a complete quadriplegia and uh, on the ct there was an occipital c1 assimilation there and c2 c3 assimilation along with the subluxation you can see it here the bones are fused and these are very challenging cases the anatomy is distorted the uh, ch children bore are not well developed and big enough to take the traditional kind of uh, fixation screws you can see here there is bacillary invagination as well and uh, you can see here that the vertebral artery were bang on top of the joints which uh, i was uh, really worried how will i be able to dissect and uh, to get these uh, trans articular screws they because these vertebral arteries ha had an anomalous course directly over the joints so this is how i chose to fix it uh, the patient was laid supine and um, fixed with a mayfield frame and you can see here that the and uh, in this case i used an endoscopic uh, decompression technique and you can see here that the navigation tracker has been placed on the endoscope and this is how you uh, accurately using the endoscope from the anterior approach itself he was decompressed you can see that the endoscope is just reaching at the c1 uh, c2 level and you can see here that using these endoscopic burr and uh, uh, ablation te techniques i was able to decompress anteriorly you can see that the odontoid has been totally removed and the patient has been fixed and stabilized so what are the unrecognized benefits of this uh, intraoperative navigation there is an unknown relationship between implant accuracy and patient reported outcomes you can have better sizing of screws bicortical purchases interbody devices because you have a real time image on your hand and you can be uh, do all these measurements on the computer you can use the biggest screw the fattest screw which can take purchase in that pedicle and give you that correction force which is needed it reduces long level surgery and since you don't have to wear lead and all and uh, there is no exposure to the operating staff or any radiation it becomes much more safer and this paper also discusses this uh, same thing that the primary stability of the pedicle screw depends on the screw positioning and alignment so like all techniques there are some downsides there is a margin of error there is a learning curve with, uh, uh, with, uh, which is there with any new technique it is resource intensive technician training is required setup and registration process manpower everything is there it is best to think of it as a supplement and not a replacement for a spine surgeon's experience that uh, one should bear in mind 
so it is used is specifically uh, specially beneficial in academic and teaching centers where novice surgeons can attain results equivalent to that of experts we are currently doing a study on these lines so it is a uh, so this is always a concern which everybody is uh, uh, talking about that uh, is it giving us uh, safer operations but worse surgeons what if the device conks out or the there is an error in the software what uh, happens then so all these things we have to take into account while we adopt this kind of technology so this is the technology adoption life cycle of any new technology we are at uh, the early adopter phase and we have to decide where do we want to to get on this bandwagon so it's doper successful in the 20th century we are talking about morbidity which has been overall reduced to 15% but now in this 21st century we are talking about patient outcomes so image guidance can assist even the most experienced surgeon so this is the current take so we should all keep upgrading our skills and this is one question which you should ask if your cab driver is using gps why aren't you using it in the operation theater so with this i will wind up my talk and thanks for a patient hearing okay thank you thank you dr varun for sharing a wonderful uh, case series uh, using navigated yeah. uh, oa and uh, of course the navigation spine surgeries are uh, still stand for precision they are the way forward and uh, hopefully with uh, cost considerations uh, and uh, better resources available in future the cost will come down further and many centers will have navigation yes absolutely so cost in these cases we have to consider in terms of patient outcomes as well and the as you can see the novel approaches which we are able to uh, you know, adopt because of these uh, technologies which otherwise we wouldn't have even have considered okay so i request uh, dr ayush sharma to please uh, lo share the screen so i request all the speakers to be uh, to stick to their time and uh, all the participants they they are requested that if they have any question they can post it in the chat box we'll be discussing in a q and a session at the end of the initial three talks so uh, over to you dr ayush so thank you ravish and thank you varoda orthopedic association for the invite dr varun has made my job very easy because he has talked about the initial part of minimally invasive spine surgery and the next speaker will also contribute because minimally invasive spine surgery is is a spectrum it starts from where varun has started it goes through what i am talking about and it goes to endoscopic spine surgery so we three together represent i think uh, the minimally invasive spine surgery so uh, so this uh, this was a 49 uh, 49 year female she presented with uh, back pain and neurological claudication if you can say there is a acute uh, uh, sort of corps angle of 23 degree and there is 16 degree uh, mismatch in her lumbar uh, the sagittal profile these are the mri if you see there is a, uh, definitely something happening at the l3 l uh, l uh, 3 2 3 uh, level l3 4 level sorry and uh, of course the ct again shows uh, uh, some amount of instability and there is a past lysis so uh, dr ravish any any thought on this what will you do if it comes to you or any any of the panelists can what will you uh, what will you do in this case okay uh, dr ashit sir would you like to take this question okay so uh, as you can see there is the retral stresses at uh, l34 there is a vacuum sign and there is some sclerosis at 34 yeah uh, the past lysis as well yes there is a past lysis as well do you have a flexion extension view so flexion extension view as you can see it's completely yeah it's unstable yes, uh, yes. yeah there is instability but very certain instability because there is nothing no disc to move as such and her main complaint is back pain the neurological prodigation but what worried me is a 23 degree of uh, uh, scoliosis which is happening just because of one level
So mm-hmm. I, I'll go ahead. So I think everyone will agree that we need to intervene th- uh, in this patient. So this is what we did. I'll just go to a video which shows our technique of doing a minimally invasive anterior approach in such cases. So this is the patient, which I have already told you. So this is how we position the patient. Patient is on a right uh, lateral approach. This is our skin incision. So we come and around two finger breadth anterior to the uh, level. So this is L3-4 level. This is the skin marking. So this is the cranial end, as you can see in the video. This is the caudal end. And uh, this is the skin incision. It's, uh, it's uh, almost a two centimeter skin incision. So we will see throughout the surgery, we will be cutting three things. One is the skin. The other thing will be the fascia, which will come next. And the last will be the disc. So this is the fascia over the, if you remember your anatomy, uh, this is the fascia of the external oblique. So this approach is a very, very anatomical based approach. We use the anatomy. We just cut the fascia and the skin and rest of it is just split it out. We split the muscles and go in a natural corridor. So this is the external oblique muscle, which is being split. So throughout the surgery, we'll split, we'll be splitting the muscle as they come. If you remember, there are three muscles, external oblique, internal oblique, and transverse abdominis in this sequence. The same thing we are doing. You can see the now the next layer, which is the internal oblique. And they're very, very defined muscle. If you just, just even if you don't remember the name, if you look at it, you will you will be able to appreciate they come in different planes. So again, this is the internal oblique and the next uh, uh, will get the transverse abdominis muscle. So this is the transverse of abdominis and they are aligned almost uh, at uh, 90 degrees to each other. So it really makes your job easy. You can just uh, look, at, look at them and keep splitting it. And so if you see, we are not damaging anything. It's just the muscle split. The last layer is a fascia transfer salis, which is a very thin, flimsy layer. So you can just use your finger to dissect it. Now, as I go in, what I do is, I, I, as you can see in this, I, I swap the peritoneum anteriorly and I uh, palpate the sauce muscle. Now, sauce is a very big, bulky muscle. You cannot miss it. So you, this, this part of the surgery is very, very tactile guided. So basically, you source the uh, palpate the source as you can see here, and as I am putting my finger on the source, I this is my own device. Uh, this is what I use. I do it under vision, unlike uh, some surgeon who do it under navigation. So I do everything under vision. So I let this long retractor blade slide over my finger. I know where my finger is, and then I will see everything. So this now these long retractor blades will go in. And as, as we go in, my assistant will retract it and we'll see the swas. So I, as you can see here, you can see the swas muscle, which is, which is just out here. And then we can, because we can see everything, we'll gently retract the swas posteriorly to expose the disc, which is just out there. Sometimes you'll get a very good space. Sometimes you might have to work with the swas. So we're just uh, working with the swas. We'll ju- if any there is small bleeders, we can cauterize it and then we'll push the source muscle posteriorly. And as you can see, the disc space here is uh, now being uh, uh, identified. So once we have identified the disc space, we'll put the retractor system. So everything is under vision. It is like doing a CDF. You are not really uh, going blindly. So for, for us, we'll go directly under vision. And this is the dilators. Uh, because this was a completely collapsed disc space, so we have to just hammer that first dilator. And then the subsequent dilators go in. And uh, these are the serial dilators which will go in. And then we'll, uh, we'll remove the retractor blades that were kept in. And this is how it looks like in, in Siam. And then that is the, po- this is the time we confirm my, our position. This is the level we are talking about. And as you can see, this is the L3-4 and this is the disc space. There are osteophytes. Here, as you can find in some cases, we remove the osteophytes and we can use it as a, a uh, as a local bone graft, which is not good enough for this case, but at least something, something autograft is always better. And then we use these shavers to prepare our disc space. So this shavers, because you are going at an oblique angle, so you have to do a specific maneuver. As you can see, my hand is dropping and uh, posteriorly to get the angle right. 
So these savers will go in. This will gradually uh, jack up the disk space and bring it to what it, it was naturally intended to be. And we are removing the whatever uh, whatever the uh, uh, this uh, material is remaining. And these are the trials. Then we use the trial to see if it is fitting nicely. So this is orthogonal maneuver. This is the angle at which we finally put the trials in. And so see the disc as the trials go in. Your space is jacked up, and patient exactly straightens up quite nicely. And these cages are very big. You can go 12 mm, 14 mm. And they are 45 uh, millimeter in uh, in a width, so they are pretty big, massive cages, which can really do a good job with this uh, scoliosis correction. And this is the final placement of the cage, and this is how the cage looks like when you look at the C arm. And and this is after uh, the uh, this is we have done with the case. And as I close in my uh, retractor system, because we have not cut anything. Everything simply goes in, you know, falls into its anatomical corridor. So, so it is like doing a surgery with a natural plane. In 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 this particular case, we uh, then fixed her posteriorly. Now, even we can do it in a single position. What I mean is, in the lateral position where we did the anterior surgery, we could even fix the patient in the same position. And th this is what we get get. So this patient almost got completely correct both serital and coronal alignment. And this is what, so from 23.8 degree, with a single level fixation, we could bring her to 2.5 degrees. So that is the power of anterior approaches. That too, with the advantage of being a minimally invasive technique. And this is the scar mark, like Varun showed, uh, a two centimeter scar mark is all the, the, that patient gets. So. So let's see some more examples. Approach either anterior or posterior does have a better role than a traditional approach. So this year female, we did a laminectomy and fixation uh, for her some five years back. So definitely there is an adjacent segment disease that, and there is a, some amount of uh, compression happening at that adjacent segment. Now, if you see. There's an already implant. If it, a traditional surgical approach will be to remove all the implant and then extend the surgical site and you have to go ever below, put new screws. But, and this was how she was. If you see, she's very, very painful. Her, her, every step is having pain. So again, we use the same approach. We did a, did a OLIF, just a standalone cage. And this is how we could do it. And we put a plate with the cage itself. The blood loss is almost like 20, 30 ml, and uh, and the surgical times will almost about one one and a half hours, and can go up to two hours. And again, the same thing as we uh, this is the cage with the plate, and as you take out the distractor system, everything goes in with a two centimeter incision, and this is what you you could achieve. Now we have more than two year follow up, and see absolutely fine as of now. With a single two centimeter incision, you can do the whole job instead of going all posterior through a scar, which is a Sometimes could be a nightmare if you are doing a division surgery. And th imagine our own case five years back. This is what this scar we gave her for a one level fixation, and we are doing a adjacent segment in a revision case, and we could we can do everything with this much of scar. This is the anterior scar which we gave her, and this is how she is. So, so they are very very happy patient at the end of the day because we have used a completely completely anatomical pain to to get it. Again, another case where uh, MIS, I think, makes a sense. A 40-year male uh, re-prolapse at L5-S1. Again, our own case. So we have been uh, reinventing ourselves with the, some of our uh, researches and everything. So again, uh, we had done a laminectomy, as you can see here, earlier. And there was a re-prolapse after one and a half years. Again, traditional approach could be challenging. But if you, if, if you use the tubular approach and you can dock it, you, this area still remains virgin because you have got well, earlier we have gone through a laminectomy here and through through the minimally invasive approach we could get the this is the surgical video even with a very small incision and very small scar without even venturing into the earlier scar scar tissue we could get the whole disc out and so this is how it looks like this is uh, this is the revision surgery with the mis and this was our original surgery with the open approach so all these things looks good, but is there any evidence to suggest that MIS really has advantage over open surgery? 
if you look at the literature of evidence, there are 4,250 PubMed articles talking about MIS versus open surgery. But at the end of the day, you, if you're going MIS way, you need to first justify it to yourself. So this is what I think is a balanced view between uh, what MIS can do. This is uh, from uh, Roger Hartel, one of the pioneers of MIS surgery. And he talks about six T's of minimal invasive, invasive spine surgery. So what basically he says that there is a zone of benefit in minimal invasive surgery. In a very thin patient, if you're doing a discectomy, whether you do it open or MIS, it really doesn't matter. The benefit starts if you're choosing a very bulky patient. As you do more cases, you go from one level to two level, the TLF, the benefit of MIS zone is bigger. But as you go in a very complex deformity cases, the, it again comes back to the complication of MIS and, and uh, the challenges become as uh, common as that of the open surgery. But we are pushing this limit now as we do more and more like Varun with the technology coming with the, with the stealth navigation and few, few things which you can do. We are trying to increase this gap. But this is where it to, to stands today. So the most important thing in any surgery, whether it's MIS or open, is the target. You have to have to have a very good patient selection and nothing can beat that. These two MRIs look similar. Both have a, a lumbar canal stenosis, but they are completely different entity altogether. If you see here is a facetal joint destruction as well. The one of the facets is completely gone. So no matter what approach you use, you have to think that and you have to consider that before you do your surgery. Again, the other thing is to use the MIS surgery, you need to have specific system in place like this tubular, tubular retractor system. You should have a magnification, either a microscope or a loop, whichever is you prefer, both has its own advantages and disadvantages. You, you need to have this MIS burst, you need to have this bionate uh, quarteries. So these, these, you need to have this instrument. So these things comes into play. The other th things are technique. You need to have the surgical technique to do it. You need to train yourself. Once you have trained yourself, you need to test it whether I can still deliver it with MIS. And the last and the and not the least, the talent, which is inborn, which you cannot change. You should you should have some amount of uh, inborn talent to do that. So before we went, so our MIS journey is now four and a half years old. So in the first two years, we are doing both open and MIS surgery. So we, we, before we went in for total MIS surgery, now we uh, we hardly do open surgery, but at least when it comes to lumbar, we analyze our own data from the first two years. So we had 240 patients, 104 went for MIS, 136 went for open surgery, and we compared the VAS and ODI scores of our own patient, single team, single center experience. And this is what we saw. So when it comes to MIS, the VAS score is significantly better. So they have less pain for, for six months and they have less stability, disability for one for one for the first one to three months. At one year follow-up, they do both the groups they do equally well. You can say, so what does how does it matter? But imagine it is the first three, first one to three months, it is the time the patient remains with you. It is first one to three months where you, you force them to go for rehabilitation. It is first one to three months, they, they, they go back to work. If they have more pain, they're more likely to be, but they're less likely to be active. So that is where the minimal invasive surgery comes in. As we have gone in, we have tried to extend our reach. So now even we can do something like this bit more complex deformity with just OLIF and cages. So this is what we could achieve with perfectness posterior screws. This is a high-grade degenerative listhesis. Again, uh, we can now we can we have the we can, as we have done more more cases we have the ability to do this. So even a high high grade list test is a grade three or four. Can, we can do it all minimal invasive surgery. This is a uh, TLF at a quad level D D D eleven D twelve with correction of uh, chi forces. Again, we we uh, as we have as we grow and we do complex cases, we can tackle cases like this. We are even extending the limit of MIS surgery. Till recently, a conjoined nerve root was a relative contraindication for TLIF, and it was a relative contraindication for in minimally invasive tubular discectomy. We recently published our own technique, surgical technique in space and spine journal, how to get a um, uh, minimally invasive approach in present of 
conjoined nerve root. So we are every day expanding the horizon of minimally invasive spine surgery. And why, why, why is it impo important? If you see this, this is a uh, post-op MRI as Varun was talking. This beautiful muscle is what it is all about. So in a MI, this is a follow-up. Them uh, makes them uh, ha decrease the pain. They go back faster to work. And as we do more and more, uh, we are really, uh, really extending the limit. So my take-home message will, will be the patient selection and good surgical technique remains the most critical factor in patient outcome, no matter which te surgical technique you choose. MIS approach does have its advantages of faster recovery at the cost of more radiation and steeper learning curve. I will suggest MIS is good, but choose what works best in your hand. As we are going ahead, we are pushing the limit and the sky is the limit. This is one of our recently done case. If you, uh, in fact, done two days back. And if you see, uh, th there was a significant uh, mile alignment in the sagittal and the coronal profile. And three level olif, even we could not have imagined that C will line up. Not only the lumbar has lined up, but look at the thoracic. So just once we gave the lumbar lordosis, the thoracic spine just came back. So you could, you could have done a much bigger surgery in this case, but with, with two or three levels small incision, you could achieve something which we thought was very difficult to achieve earlier. So that is where the limit of uh, minimally invasive spine surgery rests. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ayush. Uh, hello. Yeah. So uh, thank you and uh, uh, all of you please uh, mute your mic. Hello. Okay. So uh, so I would now request Dr. Bhushan Khedkar to load uh, to share his screen. Uh, in the meanwhile, I would like to ask a quick comment from Dr. Ashid Mehta. Uh, I would like to say that, uh, you know, spine surgery, lumbar spine surgery initially started with anterolateral decompression for tuberculosis, anterior lumbar surgeries, then it went to all posterior. And now it has again came back to a full circle with this front and back surgeries in fashion now. So uh, what are your quick comments on that? Yeah, they were saying, you know, Approaching posterior, like going through minimal invasive anti approach. Excellent view that he was having of the lesion and it was being treated. So it's going all the circle now. Yeah. So certainly. Uh, so yeah. now an, another interesting uh, talk will be on endoscopic spine surgery. Uh, Dr. Bhushan, please uh, share your screen. Dr. Bhushan? Please not. Well, he's not there with his joint. Ah, oh, yeah, he's there. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Bishan. Yes. Yeah, good morning. Can you see me? Uh, no, we cannot see you. We can, we can hear you. You're invisible. Yeah. Visible? Mm, not yet. Not yet. Okay, can you just can you see my screen? No, we cannot see. Uh, uh, Doctor Bhushan. Yeah, I'm having some trouble. I'm not able to share the screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
okay so uh, in the meanwhile uh, i think uh, maybe you can uh, try uh, try loading your screen and in the meanwhile we'll move on to the next talk yeah you can please dr kedar hello yeah am i audible yeah yeah please go ahead uh, are you ready to present your case yeah yeah it's ready uh, just let me share the screen just let me know if it's visible yes it's visible yeah yeah just a second all right so i'll be presenting two cases uh, simple ones compared to what dr varun and uh, ayush presented today wonderful uh, case presentation by both of them so uh, i'll start with case 1 uh, we have a elderly female with a history of trivial fall at home she had complaints of weakness in both lower limbs since the fall with inability to walk severe backache restricting her functions and also complaints of uh, bladder and bowel incontinence and she was since uh, she was on bed rest since one week uh, with no improvement and she uh, you know uh, came to the hospital for further intervention um so are you sure here Yeah, I'm there. Tell me. Yeah, Ayush. Yeah. So, can you just comment on the MRI? Uh, so, I think it looks like uh, she is osteoporotic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is a compression fracture. Right. It's a, some sort of compression. Uh, uh, some sort of. No report in it. Partly. There's a compression at the roots, uh, the cord as well, and that I think has led to the deficit part. Yeah. Right. Right. And also, you can see uh, the compression has is more than fifty, sixty percent of the vertebra. Yeah. there's an is a un, like unstable situation with the cord yeah yeah true so i don't have the x rays here but i'll just show you the uh, mri kale 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 no just so see na mukin jao phir mukin jao sahab jo le se hello yeah yeah go ahead please yeah so the coronal uh, view as well you can see you know um, the compression fracture uh, and on the axial views not much of a compression on the cord but i think it's the instability that probably would be causing you know the weakness and uh, bladder and bowel incontinence um so uh, i mean there are no two doubts about it uh, you know what you would do with this case um so what are the indications of surgery in such cases where you know patient presents with a osteoporotic fracture neurological involvement if there is weakness uh, of you know uh, lower limbs difficulty in walking severe pain you know incapacitating pain on movements which which is because of the instability and bladder and bowel incontinence so clear cut indications for surgery now the question is what are the options that we will explore um ravish hello yeah hi yeah hi ravish uh, would you like to comment what are the surgical options we would like to explore in this case yeah so uh, usually for an osteoporotic fracture uh, we usually tend to nowadays uh, we tend to do a fixation along with a uh, anterior whatever you do like vertebroplasty or reconstruction yeah. but we tend to fix long right and uh, the options that are available is we you do go for vertebral plasty we go for uh, uh, a cage plasty and in some cases we even go for an corpectomy but uh, considering the age and uh, the situation i think uh, vertebral plasty with uh, cement of i at least i go to up to down to up to down great so what about dexa i mean we need to get a dexa scan because we need to know the yes. hold of the screws that we are you know uh, yes. going to insert so um, so we got a dexa scan in this case she had a you know minus 3 uh, t um, scores and uh, severely osteoporotic and that's that was that was obvious uh, which led to the fracture so cement augmented screws how many of you uh, dr varun dr varun is here yeah yeah hi yeah hi varun uh, yeah. so cement do you use cement augmented screws uh, with a you know a low dexa score in osteoporotic fractures yeah absolutely absolutely i use them and uh, even these can be done percutaneous by the way and if we have this device we can pour, uh, the cannulated screw yeah. uh, through that we can push in the screw and perfect. there is an op open option as well so it is a very good strategy in my books yeah perfect 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 so uh, all right so as we discussed long segment fixation uh, we generally go two up or three up and three down to give a long segment um, uh, stability we use long pedicle screws compared to you know the usual case scenario we also try for bicortical uh, fixation 
cement augmentation yeah we can go for either fenestrated screws or we can put cement in and then put the regular screws as well we can do a vertebro or a kyphoplasty at the level of the fracture and uh, the cross link uh, some of some of the times we use cross link to increase the stability sometimes we don't all right so this is what uh, we did here uh, we did a two level uh, you know cement augmented fixation at uh, t12 and l1 levels and at l2 where there was a fracture we did a vertebroplasty and we stabilized uh, two level uh, two levels down as well so this is the ap and lateral view uh, patient gradually recovered over a period of time with physiotherapy and the most important consideration that we need to do is treat the osteoporosis so you have treated the fracture you have got her you know um, biomechanics treated but we need to treat the osteoporosis so there are various you know uh, options and it's a big topic that we can uh, talk about so a terry parotid allen donates the uh, dinos to map uh, we we generally brace the patient for 3 to 6 months uh, we have to you know uh, teach them about self care at home supplement with calcium and vitamin d and uh, other precautions so um, only question here is uh, to dr ayush Oh, tell me yeah uh, so what is your choice of uh, anti osteoporotic uh, you know medication that you use in severe osteoporosis in these cases we put them on a combination of terifrac and denosumab that is our protocol okay yeah. so see all my instrumented cases with the uh, dexa minus 3 i okay. put them for a terifrac and denosumab so combination of both for initial one year at least and then we see how the dexa is, uh, works because they are the best combination while terry frac it, it, it's a it's a like it even increases your bone density denosumab is best in preserving it so you get both best of both the world but again they, this is like uh, the best option but you have to consider other things like cost and everything but i think if you cannot give both definitely a terry frac for uh, at least 3 uh, months to 1 year depending on what patient can Um, uh, afford and then shift to maybe another anti osteoporotic. Right. Uh, another question here was the duration. Uh, like you know, there are many papers which show that teriparatide has to be given for at yes. least a year and a half or two to you know attain a certain level of bone uh, density increase. So uh, the so question that, is whether you know three months, six months of therapy of teriparatide is it going to be useful? So, so the problem is not that three months, six months. The problem is you can give. You cannot give. Uh, you should give. Uh, at a stretch if you you cannot do so once you have stopped uh, the terry frac it says that if you again restart it it doesn't work that well so they say you give it for two year stretch so that is a problem there is no problem with the stopping at three months or six months but then you have to see the patient and you need to supplement it but it's it's a one shot so one shot means you if you want to give your best shot you should do give it for two years that's where the recommendation comes for two years exactly and also i think there are uh, the reason for that is there have been cases of osteosarcoma which have been reported by repeated uses of uh, teriparatide so in certain studies of course that's not validated so that's the you know danger of uh, using uh, teriparatide for short term and again repeating it again what about denosumab uh, dr varun uh, do you use denosumab and what is the duration that you recommend uh, denosumab uh, actually i haven't used personally as yet because of the cost factor and availability in my region another thing which i would point out which everybody uh, which we as orthopedic surgeons are little scared to use our selective estrogen receptor modulators or serms because right. that is one uh, basic cause of these osteoporosis in these elderly females and we should be tackling that as well True. so we should it's a good idea to have a look at them as well so denosumab we use it very very frequently so the good part about denosumab is six months sleep so you you know the compliance is very so for example my center both are free to the patient so whatever reasons okay so you know we have the freedom to give you to every patient one or both of them so that is where we have the experience of giving it the, the problem with terifrac even if it's free the compliance is very very poor so that to be very frank so that's why the other reason we put them on terifrac plus denosumab because denosumab the compliance is far better because it's six monthly uh, one injection six monthly and it has a safety data of 10 years so you can really give so normally these patient will come to you 50 60 years old so 10 years is you want your implant to survive 10 years you put them on denosumab cost remains a factor as i can understand but if you have the option of giving i think it is a, it is it the compliance wise and uh, the the amount of uh, 
uh, the treatment by today it, it it is the gold standard absolutely absolutely totally agree with you i think the compliance as i have seen with my patients as well you know someone was very comfortable once in 6 months subcutaneous dose you know at the opt level compared to terifrac you know where uh, patients get fed up 2 uh, or 3 months into the therapy true um all right so let's move on to case 2 um we have a middle aged female here who presented with you know low back pain um she was a known case of ankylosing spondylitis no history of trauma no other constitutional symptoms uh, like weight loss or uh, loss of appetite she had no relief with conservative trial so she was on analgesic she was on physiotherapy um no radiculopathy uh, you know no claudication just the back ache lower back ache Uh, which generally most of the patients you know uh, present in the opd so she presented with low back um with this x-ray um dr ravish yeah yeah can you just uh, yeah highlight what the x-ray says yes yeah, so there are multiple uh, uh, there there is it's typically a bamboo spine where there is fusion of anterior longitudinal ligament and then posterior and lateral longitudinal ligament as well so this is a classical case of uh, ang spawn and uh, in such cases i think the most commonly missed lesion is anderson lesion yeah so and that i think maybe it can only be identified with a good ct scan yeah. perfect perfect yeah but this was two months uh, earlier when she presented with back ache okay so the expert so then uh, she had she had seen a uh, you know physician who got a mri done so uh, there was a lesion at l2 level where you can see posterior bulging of the vertebra and uh, there was uh, you know minimal cord compression but with no neuro deficit so then she saw a couple of other doctors uh, neurologists who one of them advised biopsy um, but the patient you know uh, was not in severe pain so she was able to manage with analgesics but you know uh, able to carry out her daily activities so she basically ignored this um, lesion the advice for biopsy was uh, ignored and she carried on um, so this was done uh, when she initially presented so uh, well what happened next she came two months later with you know severe back pain in the emergency unable to walk weakness in both lower limbs you know she was not able to even sit for a single minute but no bladder and bowel involvement so basically back pain with weakness in both lower limbs and you know severe severe pain with vas pores over 10 so she was in severe pain and uh, with difficulty we got an mri done so look what's here uh, dr varun hello yeah yeah here. here just a minute yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, there is a lesion at uh, l2 uh, i'll show you the previous mri so this is what it was 2 months ago and uh, this is what it is now yes so, so in my books i would uh, go in with a biopsy at this stage right yeah with a with a neuro deficit would you like to go ahead and operate as well yeah that is a good option uh, but sometimes the patients want to have a clear idea and uh, for planning of surgery so you right. can put them on steroids first uh, let's see how the neuro deficit and get the biopsy and okay. if the patient is ready you can directly go in with the surgery and get the biopsy at the same time perfect perfect so we did the same thing we gave her uh, solimedrol 1 g uh, and we observed her for her uh, you know uh, pain scores we also you know put her on fentanyl patch we put her on analgesics uh paracetamol diclofenac so we did what best we could but the pain was just not relenting um so then we decided to go ahead for surgery and uh, we had to because it was a case of ankylosing spondylitis with with a lesion uh, which we didn't know it could be a tumor it could be you know an infection uh, less likely it was andersons <coughs> sorry so we wanted to know what exactly uh, we have to do so the surgical considerations here we got a dexa scan done luckily Uh, her dexter scores were normal uh, we generally do encounter osteoporotic osteoporotic uh, vertebra in uh, ankylosing spondylitis so the dexter was normal in this patient then comes the fixation levels uh, uh, you know uh, going in into ankylosing spondylitis whether it was an infection andersons instability uh, we didn't know so <coughs> excuse me so we had to look at the fixation levels generally in ankylosing spondylitis where the you know vertebra acts as a long bone uh we were thinking of uh, fixation up and down at least three levels then decompression yes there was a lesion uh, at you know in the posterior elements there was compression on the cord with weakness in the lower limbs so we had to decompress as well and of course biopsy the gold standard we need to go and get the diagnosis so the biopsy as well so this is what we did here um 
basically we did three level fixation below four level fixation above and we also did a you know uh, smith peterson osteotomy did a decompression tried to correct the uh, deformity which happened uh, on its own not not the, the funda was not to correct the deformity and we also sent the uh, material for biopsy so post operatively uh, the patient turned out to be tuberculosis uh, on gene expert and pcr it was luckily uh, you know uh, sensitive to rifampicin she was put on you know 9 month course of uh, anti tubercular therapy and uh, patient responded well so uh basically what we did here was long fixation sometimes you know uh, in the hindsight i thought it was an overkill going four levels above uh, but clinically the patient is doing really well so happy with that so what were the challenges in this case the dexa was normal otherwise in osteoporosis uh, in ankylosing spondylitis we think of uh, you know uh, low dexa low t scores osteoporotic fractures and again go in with uh, cement augmented screws uh, neuro deficit positioning of the patient is very important she already had a deficit here when in ank spond with uh you know and anderson's lesion uh, positioning the patient and correcting the deformities is really challenging so you have to be very careful otherwise you know it can lead to catastrophic um, uh, consequences and the diagnosis generally we don't think of uh, dual diagnosis in orthopedics that's what we are thought of, uh, you know thought about but here we had tuberculosis with ankylosing spondylitis of course here uh, uh, we're not talking about the deformity correction uh, but yes in ankylosing spondylitis uh, deformity corrections and you know uh, stabilizing it to normal anatomical levels is a real challenge uh i, I would like to thank baroda orthopedic association um, the, uh, the president and secretary uh, sir to uh, you know thank you for giving me an opportunity to present my cases and uh, over to ravish yeah thank you thank you dr keda it was a wonderful talk and uh, now i now i uh, i think uh, now i call dr ashish mehta sir to that so that we can start the q and a session uh, sir would you like to sir would you like to ask any question yeah just uh, my question dr kedar fadke what would have been ideal level of fixation in last case of ankylosing spondylitis uh, yes, you, yes yeah 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 that's difficult to say that's what i said at the hands high yeah. side uh, yeah, yeah. but anyway on the safer side i would you know still prefer to go three up three down okay uh, yeah in case if it was not tuberculosis or something else uh, then we would have landed in a soup so uh, basically because we went in uh, you know directly with the surgery and biopsy uh, at the same setting uh, and with that lesion i think uh, in the hindsight yes uh, but i think patient is doing well so i'm happy with what i did i understand, understand. just yes. wanted to know yes yeah. yes okay okay dr kedar uh, there is an uh, interesting question which i often get uh, from orthopedic fraternity right uh, is there any advantage of doing a kyphoplasty during the kyphoplasty material you need to have a balloon and the cost you know significantly increases uh, the advantage is uh, in kyphoplasty you are the chances of you know getting a good uh, inflation of the vertebra which is damaged uh, is is you know is significant so uh, it gives better results compared to vertebroplasty and the most significant advantage is the cement that goes in while doing a vertebroplasty uh, is you know uh, is not in a liquid form so the chances of it you know going into the canal going uh, either anteriorly into the disc i mean into the anterior uh, longitudinal ligament or going posteriorly uh, into the disc or you know having a neuro genic damage because of the thermal uh, you know um, capacity i think kyphoplasty has a much much better uh, advantage um, but i think it's the same in good hands i think vertebroplasty is good enough uh, as kyphoplasty but what i would suggest is if you are doing a stand alone uh, you know uh procedure then kyphoplasty is much superior to vertebroplasty if you are augmenting with screws and you are doing a fixation then i think vertebroplasty uh, works wonders as well okay okay yeah one question at what stage you think of not going for vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty do you look for that uh, uh, cities can you see the yes we need to get an mri yes sir yeah. uh, ideally i think uh, if you are you know planning to go for a kypho or a vertebroplasty um then yeah you wait for 2 3 weeks of course you give the conservative trial you see how the patient is responding uh what about his pain relief and all that uh and yeah i think i would generally keep a you know cut off at maximum of 3 months because what happens later on is uh, the bone is anyway going to get fused and uh, there is going to be sclerosis so if you're planning for a vertebra or a kyphoplasty 3 months post the fracture levels 
with the patient in conservative management mostly on bed rest it is going to be really difficult to get the cement in or even try to you know recorrect the deformity so if you want to go in uh, and the patient you know, you have to educate them this is the right time to go in and go in now uh, but if you know the patient is hesitant and uh, not willing for surgery or if you feel conservative management helps then uh, there's no point in you know thinking of a vertebra or a kyphoplasty at a later date of course we need to uh, get an mri in cumul's lesions where you know you still see a gap uh, you still see you know fluid filled cavity uh, in the mri even after post 3 months uh, then that's a good indication for uh, still going in for a vertebroplasty so that is where you have pseudo arthrosis and then probably you yeah. can think where the you know the patient may benefit but once you uh, have seen lot of pictures uh, where, i mean you get the x rays done there is sclerosis there is already a collapse which is healing then uh, there's really no point in doing a vertebroplasty okay Okay. Uh, the one patient, Doctor Varun. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you have also shown. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, you have shown a slide on uh, navigation guided kyphoplasty, and uh, I I get this uh, question repeatedly from uh, orthopedic surgeons that uh, when to do a vertebroplasty alone, and when to do a fixation along with vertebroplasty, and uh, what, what what is your take? How do you decide that you will do just a navigation guided kyphoplasty vertebroplasty or you will add fixation also so i think that would depend upon the quality of bones of the patient the dexa score and it is always you see as you put the cement which gets hardened and the bones are really soft due to osteoporosis you are putting like a stone in a piece of bread so there is always a chance of the other vertebra is collapsing so it is just a judgment call in that a uh, fixation in that sense gives an additional support to the bone till the time your anti osteoporotic medication is working so like uh, kedar had uh, shown in the previous case it is always better to err on the safer side and go long rather than fall short and have a re procedure on your hand that is my uh, belief okay uh, do you do you take a standing and a supine x ray uh, before surgery in such patients to judge the instability yeah and sometimes even a flexion extension x ray is quite uh, helpful in uh, judging where you need to do yeah okay uh, dr ayush yeah yeah so so i have few takes on this first of all like uh, to divide between uh, kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty our protocol is if we see the void opening up very nicely which you will see most of the time we get a standing setting or uh, or as our flexion extension view then both of them they work equally good because you have void and you could fill it in whether you use a kyphoplasty or or I, uh, it doesn't matter but if it is not opening then and you need to create some space for your uh, cement to go in that is where the balloon kyphoplasty has some role how big a role that is up to this uh, controversial but this is what we feel so if we see there is a good most of the cases you will see a good void there is space to fill in I, and we will go for vertebral plasty but if we see there is not 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 much space to uh, put my cement in that is a time we will uh, opt for a uh, balloon kyphoplasty and uh, when it comes to adding instrumentation if i am at a junctional level and if there is significant significant vertebral collapse then i think we will prefer a instrumentation and what we do is we'll put the screws in along with the vertebral plasty means the, even the index vertebra will we will involve so it will be a short segment with the index vertebra and the the screws will go uh, through the pedicle and it will become like a uh, uh, yeah, cement augmented screws so that is our strategy if we are we are not in the junctional level it is l2 3 then i think the forces are not that great and you can get away with a simple vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty but there is a lot of controversy in this so each surgeon will do it as per his uh, experience and as he see fit yeah absolutely uh, dr keda kya yeah, ravish yeah so uh, i just want to ask that apart from cement augmentation what are the other uh, strategies or what are the other uh, things that a surgeon can do to increase the pull out strength any uh, particular uh, medial angulated screw or what yeah, are the other yeah, options yeah, right, if yeah, you don't want because cement augmented screws can, cannot be salvaged right if, exactly. if they are once in you cannot change it so yeah, so the I... reason want to use that So, what are the other methods to increase? Yeah, so there are two, three things which you can do. Uh, one is using a, you know, uh, increasing the medial angulation, as you said. So, uh, medial angulation increases the pull-out strength. Um, you can use a bicortical screw. Uh, so, uh, you know, piercing both the uh, anterior and the posterior cortex of the vertebra. Uh, you can use larger, uh, you know, diameter screws. 
so generally we uh, you know in adult uh, we generally go with 6.5 mm screw so you can go up to 7 7.5 whatever is available so uh, longer screws uh, bigger screws and also you can add a cross link so uh, these are the things which i think uh, will help you in you know uh, aiding a fixation of osteoporotic fracture but if i mean the cement is the best best thing what i feel uh, uh, does well so even if you even if you don't have fenestrated screws uh there's a tip and technique to use you know simple uh, cementation and the normal screws so what i generally do is you know i make my pedicle holes uh and then i prepare my uh, you know vertebra uh, which has to be cemented with the screws so uh, two holes on either side i make the pedicle uh, you know uh, holes keep everything ready mix the cement for you know one vertebra so that will be around 1 1.5 to 2 ml so fill in the cement which goes in anteriorly and then use the screws so we put in the cement Uh, like a normal vertebroplasty and then uh, you know uh, introduce the uh, pedicle screws so that way it gives you know wonderful fixation uh, yes the only issue is salvage but luckily i think uh, so far uh, so good but yeah when that time comes i think we'll have to you know look for other options as well of course there are uh, you know new ha coated screws as well um, so uh, just like we use in orthopedics so ha coated pedicle screws but the problem with ha coated screws is the ha uh, component takes at least 6 to 9 months to get incorporated into the bone so it is not given, going to give you a, you know immediate uh, benefit in terms of fixation okay okay uh, dr vivek parik wants to ask a question please go ahead sir uh, dr vivek parik okay i think uh, okay so uh, my next question is to dr ayush uh, Yeah. you have nicely demonstrated uh, lateral lumbar interbody or oblique lumbar interbody fusion uh, can you just uh, brief us about uh, what are the advantages in terms of sagittal balance uh, compared to a posterior t lift if i am doing a one or two level uh, fusion in a patient with a high pelvic incidence what uh, is there an advantage of doing a oblique lateral interbody fusion compared to a posterior t lift standard t lift that we do yeah so exactly so see the problem is when you are putting a t lift cage you know the the dimension of the cage in in a big vertebra like this you are putting a small cage which is roughly around uh, 10 to uh, 20 mm in uh, in uh, in dimension and you are trying to jack it up so it doesn't really happen because it it is just covers the maybe 30 20 to 35% of of your interbody work so you don't get the high the disc space or the d rotation so best part about doing the anterior approach and putting this big cages not only you restore the height but as you restore the height you see in the case they d rotate because the primary pathology was the collapse of the disc as they collapse they rotate okay so once you put the cage from end plate to end plate we put around 50 mm size of cage 45 to 50 so it really jacks up the whole body and that is where you see the dramatic change in both the sagittal and the corning balance so that is the biggest advantage so if the same amount of work you have to do from posterior you'll have to do multiple levels you need to do complete fasectectomy maybe add a pso maybe add a pedicle subtraction osteotomy so instead of doing all that which you do just to get the same amount of uh, correction you can go and theory entirely and do the primary work so i believe and most of people who do this believe the primary pathology didn't start from the back the primary pathology started with the disc per se it is the disc which which degenerated lost its height derotated and that is what has led to all the stenosis the facellar arthropathy all the pain generated so you correct the primary pathology and everything falls into place once in a while you might might not be able to correct the primary pathology and then you might have to add a posterior once in a while but most of the time you if you correct the primary pathology that is what we have seen not only the lumbar corrects as i showed you in the last case even the thoracic and cervical corrects because they because they lost the lumbar lordosis they go for cervical kyphosis and they extend the neck just to compensate for the whole anatomical change so this is this is what and this is evolving still the data of olef or interbody is 10 years old so we don't know where we will land up but as we are doing more cases we are we are seeing uh, good results and we are expanding our band 
Okay. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Ayush. Yeah. Yeah, I just yeah, one question yeah. to Dr. Ayush. Yeah, yeah. Ayush, yeah, I'm a great fan of your work. Um, you Thank do wonderful you. surgeries. Yeah, it's really good yeah, to see. I'm the old friend from uh, yeah, Ayush. Ayush. <laughs> That's a different thing. <laughs> All right. See, Ayush, uh, I just want to, I mean, I'm also a fan of anterior surgeries and, uh, you know, the future is really, I mean, divided between the East and West. So if you look at the Western part of the world, uh, uh, you know, for them, TLIF is an obsolete surgery, um, which I find uh, very amusing, actually. Um, but yes, they are more into anterior, more into anterior. Uh, they think TLIF does not give them good correction. I agree with them when it comes to deformity corrections. But, uh, you know, certain cases where single level pathology or maybe two level pathology, I think uh, a TLIF uh, is as good as, you know, a OLIF or a ALIF. Of course, in revision surgeries where you want to go from the front where the back has been, you know, uh, like the cases which you showed, then I think, yes, anterior surgeries have, you know, a wonderful role to play. But I find it funny when they say that, you know, uh, for a single level pathology, uh, you know, anterior surgeries are superior to, you know, TLIF. That's one thing. Second, yeah, so just to add on to that. Now, if you go to, you know, the uh, Eastern part of the world, like Korea or, you know, Japan, where they are into endoscopy, mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, minimal invasive, li uh, limited pathological work. And they, they really are now going into, uh, you know, TLIFs, X TLIFs, lateral TLIFs, uh, endoscopic TLIFs. So what I see is a lot of amount of TLIF work done there with equally good results and huge number of papers coming up. So it's really difficult, you know, uh, to, you know, say one technique is superior to the other. Uh, totally agree with you in revision cases with multiple levels of deformity, obese patients. Um, yes, anterior surgery works wonders. Uh, but I'm I'm really skeptical about, uh, you know, people just writing off TLF. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So I agree with you completely. So I will tell you, we are in between the East and the West. So we have to have a balanced view. So I'll tell you, on an average, we'll do only two to three OLIFs in a month. At the same time, we are doing at least 20 TLIFs. And I am a bigger fan of TLIF any given time. It's a wonderful, wonderful surgery. And you can get almost everything. But, yeah. you know, OLIF has an advantage in specific case. So I, I always keep it as a my jackhammer. When you want to get more out of a single level. Yeah. But anything you do, and it is not an easy thing. There's so many things. As you do more, there are vascular anatomy, there is a nerve. So everything has pits and falls. So you have to have a balanced view. Use We use OLIF where a single level of TLIF might not be able to achieve what we want it to. In rest, everything, everything, I think TLIF is safer. It remains my workforce and I'll prefer it any given day. So that is where I stand between the East and the West. Yeah, great, great. Perfect. <laughs> okay. okay, so let's move ahead. Uh, Dr. Ayush, one closing remark. Uh, would you just elaborate on the contraindications for uh, anterior interbody, anterior oblique interbody fusion, uh, so, uh, vascular anatomy, suas uh, position? So, so most important, like any case, is your patient selection. So before even you attempt an anterior interbody fusion, go through your MRI. You will be surprised we have seen a kidney in the corridor where it is supposed to be go because there was aberrant kidney. You'll get a vein, you'll get a artery. So go through your MRI. There has to be natural corridor between your swas and the blood vessels for this case to go in. And if you cannot see that corridor, go for a TLIF. It is not that you should not think yourself that I'm an OLIF surgeon or a MIS surgeon. You are a surgeon first. And let's see what works in your hand. So patient selection, I think, like any case and uh, any other technique, remains the workhorse, uh, remains the most important thing, which uh, which uh, which you should see before you go for an anterior. Okay, thank you. That's very well said. Uh, Dr. Varun, uh, there is one question from uh, Dr. Ashit Mehta. What is the economics of navi navigated fixation in view of uh, insurance companies and are they trying to squeezing in, decrease the cost, or are they ready to pay for the extra uh, extra for such work? So as far as in India, as of now, there is no extra reimbursement for any navigation or MIS or any endoscopy. It is just you have to convince the patient and maybe factor in the cost according to how your system works. Uh, there is no distinction even in Ayushman, there is no distinction for an MIS case or an endoscopy case or for the insurance companies, whether you are doing it open, whether you are doing it MIS. It is just the patient benefit at the end of the day, which uh, helps you 
select your uh, te- technique and see whether the economics work in your uh, particular setup that is all that i can say on this regard but how can you make the economics in that case when you increasing the cost uh, so that should... that question is a big uh, debate i actually. know that's you know, basically yeah. this is a problem they are so, not ready to pay extra for the quality yeah that's so that problem. is there that is there and that is where how you counsel and uh, you know how do you counsel and convince the patient comes in and uh, mm. most of these things are disposable and like in india we are used to have those middle ground where you can uh, re eto your uh, uh, jamshedi needles or your navigation trackers and things like mm. that so these kind of things do help you to match the cost and um, uh, i guess it is you see when you look at the overall picture in the sense if an open surgery case tends to stay in your hospital for 14 days the it is the same bill and uh, uh, when he has to stay in for just say one day you make mm-hmm. the same bill but you are uh, saving in that sense okay. so maybe that can uh, you know give you an idea Yeah. Okay, so uh, we will take this last question, and I want all the speakers and uh, panelists to participate. Uh, what are your osteoporosis treatment protocols? So there is one question from Dr. Alpesh Parekh. When do we stop alendronate? So I just want to know everybody's overview. Tariffrac, denosumab, and and alendronate. When? How do you select? So I'll uh, start with uh, Dr. Kedar. Yeah. All right. So yes, I think uh, as we discussed about teriparatide, uh, I generally would prefer to give it uh, for a year and a half or two years at a stretch, single you know single shot. So uh, yes, with you know with moderate DEXA scores, with you know not very low DEXA scores, I think uh, I generally stick to prefer to you know yearly dose of zoledronic acid injection, uh, then supplement it with ibandronic acid, one fifty milligram once a month. So for you know, not severely osteoporotic, with you know osteopenia moderate or uh, you know low osteoporotic profile. i would stick to still the conventional zolentronic acid injections once a year along with um, yeah but if it's a operative case with low t scores and you have intervening where you want to save your implants and you want to give good benefit to the patient and faster recovery uh, yes then either a teriparatide and denosumab uh, can be used like what dr ayush uses the same protocol that i follow uh, so i generally uh, start with teriparatide um, you know and then supplement it with denosumab uh, once in 6 months the only question uh, when i do this is the you know compatibility with teriparatide so i don't want the patient to stop it in 3 months because i'm sure that does not give any benefit so uh, i i ask the patient if you're ready to take it for a year and a half or two uh, then start with teriparatide and if you're not really willing then i think there's no point in taking it so then i stick to denosumab and maybe uh, zolentronic acid um zolentronic acid uh, we generally wait for at least 5 to 7 years Uh, there are you know reports of jaw necrosis i don't know how many of us have seen that but theoretically yes uh, so 5 years of zolentronic acid if you are using just ibandronates where uh, you know you're giving orally um, once a month or once a week then uh, ideally it has to be taken for at least 10 years so you can't 5 uh, to 10 years that's what the period we are looking at so um, yeah that's that's the general protocol that i follow in acute uh, cases with severe back pain due to osteoporosis i also add on uh, calcitonin nasal spray uh works wonders uh, in vertebral pain initial okay okay dr ayush uh, since you are using denosumab uh, there are few reported uh, studies like data studies data extension studies which have uh, shown that when you discontinue denosumab there is oh, a sudden right. fall in the osteo in the level of bone mineral density so uh, they have recommended supplementing you know uh, continue either denosumab for lifelong 6 to 10 years or you know switching over to a zolentronic acid so how do you manage how do you stop denosumab after 2 years or you keep on continuing for life long so you know even if you give it for free i don't think anyone will take any drug for more than a specific period that is a problem we all have a very short memory so once the pain goes out they will throw it out so ideally ideally what they say is right you, once you start a denosumab you should continue for 10 years but practically and even even uh, and commercially is not viable so what do you do after a year or so most of the we are talking about uh, uh, fractures or maybe a surgical case so you know that within a year or whatever has happened has happened you fracture is also consolidated your uh, your uh, uh, your implants are stable then you switch it to oral or with calcium and vitamin d what uh, idar was talking about and try to give them at least a monthly uh, uh, dose of anti osteoporotic treatment maybe oral so that they can and hope that they take uh, they continue to take it but i i think for first year 
especially for a fracture or uh, if you have operated on a patient with a uh, with a decently bad dexia score i think perifrac or denizumab should be given without any doubt okay uh, dr varun yeah so i think uh, dr kedar and dr ayush have given a comprehensive overview but in my practice uh, teriparatide terifrac is the main workhorse and i tend to give it to the patient as long as they can take normally i found find it for 2 to 6 months the other part is do not combine bisphosphonates with your teriparatide because they have a counter action to each other so you are just wasting your uh, teriparatide by giving a bisphosphonate in addition because of the osteoclastic action, uh, action of both they becomes counter productive that is one thing which uh, you need to keep in mind and also increase the calcium dosage because as the body's requirement for uh, healing increases the uh, higher dose of calcium is needed these are some few uh, things which i think people tend to neglect okay uh, dr ashid mehta sir uh, a question to you yeah uh, usually i use uh, patient who are not complying zolantonic acid once a year because it is at least ensures that they're taking something of that otherwise at i find hardly i find patient taking beyond 3 months luckily all the companies were providing teriparate they also supply free calcium supplementations so that is also ensure so that is what i use yeah yeah so exactly i think most of the panelists they are of the view that uh, in patients who are having documented uh, osteoporosis severe osteoporosis or who are having fractures i think it is better to start with a teriparate or it may be a combination of teriparatide with denosumab and then later on switch over to uh, denosumab or zolantonic acid alone and in patients who are not having any significant uh, uh, osteoporotic fracture but they are just having low dexa skin it is better to start with a zolantonic acid so with this remark uh, we move forward uh, shall i invite dr bushan uh, are you ready yes i am i'm ready uh dr bushan is having some problem loading its screen so i'll be loading it from uh, sharing scre- screen uh, from my end yeah i can do it let me try it uh, okay here yeah, try please yeah, yeah we are visi- you are visible now yes yeah thank you okay perfect yeah we can see your screen <laughs> yeah good morning and sorry for the inconvenience i'm thankful to baroda orthopedic association for giving a chance to present my case i was asked to present a case in endoscopic spine surgery but i'll be talking about little advances and its utility with its uh, case presentation now endoscopic spine surgery has advanced from generations first generation was percutaneous endoscopic lumbar discectomy second generation came with interlaminar decompression and disc uh, excision third generation came with a decompression foramenotomy and now in newer innovation we are up to lumbar interbody fusion with the help of endoscopes so it's a full endoscopic interbody fusion through uniportal approach and now with this newer innovation we could do transpedicular lumbar decompression biopsy and disc excision as well in 1990 Campbell introduced the anatomical understanding of transforaminal approach and triangular safe zone, where a lesion can be approached without neural damage. Evolution of transforaminal approach first young did inside-out technique in which we landed into the disc core of the disc and we tried to remove the fragment of the disc, and in next outside approach in which we directly approach the fragment of disc into the canal and we try to remove it totally. this is the bony limitation for transforaminal approach and in which there is a possibility of neural damage if there is aberrant nerve root in venous plexus so in that case we have to do the excision of the superior articular facet of inferior vertebra and in some time we have to even drill the lower pedicle of adjacent vertebra as well the current applications of transforaminal approach are limited in which we can do trans uh, targeted fragmentectomy which is in which we can land directly into the canal instead of going into the disc for migrated disc excision we do transpedicular endoscopy that to in high migrated in which the disc is adjacent to the pedicle of vertebra lower vertebral uh, pedicle is a good landmark through which we can enter and remove the disc we 
uh, normally do nucleoplasty and annuloplasty because annuloplasty and nucleoplasty is the set of uh, surgery which is routinely done for the patients of uh, chronic back pain. We do spinal decompression in which a lateral recess and foraminal uh, uh, stenosis is easily approached. Spinal fusion, as I said, it's in advanced uh, endoscopy in which we do your uh, isolated trans uh, from, uh, foraminal endoscopic fusion. Again, we do epidurioscopy for uh, feedback surgery syndrome. We can do lavage and drainage for infectious spondylodiscitis with the help of endoscopy. These are some paper uh, evidences for transforaminal uh, discectomy. And we have found that there is good uh, uh, results in isolated uh, lumbar discectomy in all types of lumbar herniations. This was an attempt in uh, 2016. We tried uh, to present our work uh, for a transpedicular lumbar endoscopy. It's a case report. Previous uh, papers, they mentioned transpedicular approach for thoracic disc lesions. I'm going to present a case for transpedicular endoscopy. This is a 56 year old male. Main complaint was low back pain with left low limb radiculopathy for six month duration. This pain increased on walking, bending forwards, and patient couldn't sleep at night, which indicates that the disc or the lesion or the pathology was big enough to cause the pain. His pain score was nine, and there was no relief on giving conservative treatment and root block as well. So these are the MRI scans of patient in which you could see a lesion at the level of L4 vertebra. It's next and immediately adjacent to the left pedicle of L4 vertebra. Looking at the MRI scan of this patient, we get to know this is a kind of cystic lesion. Normally, this kind of lesion is a lumbar disc cyst. We call it as a discal cyst. These are the flexion extension X-rays or dynamic X-rays, which is mandatory in order to rule out the instability at particular level. If there is associated instability at the particular level, then we go for a decompression and percutaneous fusion. CT scan is mandatory in order to rule out the calcification at the level of lesion, because in that case, then the planning of surgery is a little bit different and we may opt for another route of the surgery. This is discography, which is uh, mandatory in all uh, cases in which it helps us to remove the extruded disc fragment at the time of endoscopy. In this case, we use indigo garmin, normal saline, and uh, omnipack in 2 is to 1 is to 2 proportion, which is uh, very helpful. Now you can see that there is the down migration or extrusion of the dye along the track of discal cyst adjacent to L4 pedicle. And this is the guide wire insertion in which we use the same uh, entry site like uh, transpedicular vertebral biopsy. We use a two, uh, we use nine o'clock to ten o'clock position for a left uh, vertebral uh, pedicle, and we insert the guide wire like what we uh, do for a transpedicular biopsy. The only thing is that inclination is more medial because we are uh, targeting the insertion of wire into the canal of uh, the spine. So you can see in the next uh, uh, picture that the guide wire has gone. It has passed the medial wall of a pedicle, which is the perfect position in order to tackle the intracanalicular, intracanalicular lesion. And the last uh, image is showing the location of trifine because the pedicular bone is mostly cancellous bone. And we don't have to use uh, endoscopic drills because the bone is pretty soft and you can use hand controlled refines to remove the cancellous bone. The uh, place where we have to use endoscopic drill is only the medial pedicular wall, which is a cortical bone. Now these images, image one shows the level of a trifine. We try to reach the medial wall of a pedicle with the help of trifine and rest of the drill work we do with the help of burr, which is endoscopic burr. On the guide wire, we place a trifine, over trifine, we place the cannula and 
and uh, sorry over the guide where we place trifine first and over the trifine we can uh, place the endoscopic drill after removal of the uh, trif Um, uh, fragments which this are meeting is being the recorded upper uh, vertebral body of alpha vertebra you as i said you must have uh, angulated uh, forceps you have uh, to have the probes which you can uh, control outside and uh, you have uh, to be uh, very uh, uh, watchful that you are not uh, damaging the dura above otherwise intraoperatively Dural puncture is very common. For this kind of bleeders, these you can now see there is a, a more a blood flow into the region. This blood flow is the blood coming from the neovascular granulation tissue, and you have uh, to cautery it and you have to remove the granulation tissue, which is the main cause for back pain in patients with annular fissure and annular tear. So at the time of and at the end of uh, removal of degenerated uh, disc material and the entire cyst wall, we remove and we cautery, we burn the granulation tissue. This gives maximum pain relief to the patients from chronic back pain. This is the main trick which we use in the cases of annuloplasty and nucleoplasty in which we remove the degenerated fragment material and we uh, cautery the granulation tissue at the level of annular fissure. In our practice, we have seen that more than 80% of patients who have chronic back pain have associated annular fissure and annular tear with ingrown granulation tissue. So this is actually a main chunk. And my boss this used to tell me being each time that if you are able to do all kinds of surgery, you should be able to address the back pain of the patient and, and you should know each and every detail how you can tackle the back pain of the patient because tackling back pain is actually a challenge. You can do surgery, you can go in, you can remove the disc or fragment, but even after doing a good and complete discectomy, if patient continue to have back pain, then it's considered as not a good uh, result or outcome of your procedure because patient focus on back pain. Now his leg pain is gone, then he focus on the back pain. Now in the video, you can see I'm trying to remove the disc fragments and the remain uh, uh, cyst wall. And at the same time, I'm using a pottery. Like, as I said, I'm trying uh, to burn the granulation tissue. I'll just uh, forward this video a little. Okay, I think uh, you uh, guys have uh, got idea like uh, what is the main uh, level of entry and how we remove the disc wall. I'll just escape the video and I'll go back uh, to my presentation. Yeah. So this is the post-operative MRI scan of a patient showing uh, the results. You can see in a sagittal scan, the discal cyst has been completely removed. 
and in parasitical uh, section of mri you can see the track of a pedicle which is at the level of l4 vertebra and in axial section you can see the complete removal of uh, discal cyst as well so advantages of transpedicular endoscopy are it is suitable for migrated disc i would say for high migrated disc down migrated disc or good uh, disc as well as cyst you can address the granulation tissue as well with the help of this approach it can also be used to take biopsy of epidural mass or tissue and bone window it heals faster without a pedicle fracture because the pedicle uh, core is all cancerous bone and it heals within a period of 3 to 6 months without causing pain to the patient now if we take it as a message during covid-19 pandemic endoscopic procedures reduce uh, exposure of patient to hospital environment because it's a day care procedure you hardly need to keep patient under observation we do entire procedure under local anesthesia there is no need of doing endotracheal intubation in post covid patients in which there is reduced lung volume and reduced breathing capacity of patient in those patients local anesthetic use and doing procedures under local anesthesia is fruitful and almost all procedures now are covered by insurance companies so this is a take home message and we can convert the patients who are open candidates but if you are equipped with all the equipments of endoscopy you can subject those patients for endoscopic procedures thank you thank you dr bhushan for a very nice presentation on transpedicular endoscopic disc removal very beautiful video actually there is an important statement that you made that back care should be taken care of because traditional teaching we were telling the patient that disc removal would take care of your radicular pain the back pain might remain right, so right. it's a sea change from the basic teaching that we used to have exactly now the next uh, we have uh, dr ravish patel dynamic young surgeon from baroda will presenting his cases and moderate our session dr ravish patel please uh, dr bhushan give me a, a stop screen sharing so let yeah, me yeah. Uh, share my screen dr bhushan a quick question to you yes so yeah so you know i i have uh, i i have been looking west till now it's time to look east so i was starting on the journey of indus so we are in the process of having the whole armamentarium with us so how, what do you what would be your advice to someone like we have good experience with mis but we are it is we are baby step to start the endoscopy so what will be your advice to us how about the case selection and how to go about it just one or two comments um so uh, as you know that only 5% of patients in our spine surgical practice are surgical candidates and out of those 5% handful of uh, patients are uh, candidates for endoscopic spine surgery say patient selection depends upon your own training your confidence and the equipments which you have and you have to judge well whether you will uh, be like uh, able to remove the entire pathology because half way procedure is not good in case of endoscopy if you have to open endoscopy and convert it into open procedure then we consider it as a fail endoscopy i would say go for a simple disc choose l4 5 level maximum l3 level to start with go for annuloplasty or nucleoplasty procedure first instead of trying to remove the disc fragment get your hands free uh, on endoscope uh, on annuloplasty and nucleoplasty cases and then go and then convert your uh, uh, expertise to removal of the disc at the level of discal uh, segment i would say if it's l4 5 disc go for simple disc bulge first then go for extruded fragment then go for a uh, migrated disc say high mi highly migrated disc up migrated and down migrated this is how you have to approach thank you thank you so much yeah. okay so now the last yeah. yeah ravish just sorry just one quick question yeah. uh, to bhushan uh, bhushan i just want to know from uh, your experience like uh, i think when you were in korea in 2016 to mm -hmm. what is happening in korea in 2020 uh, mm -hmm. they have shifted from anatomical the whole purpose of starting endoscopy was you know to you know maintain the anatomical architecture and all that but i have seen off late i mean a lot of presentations lot of papers where they have started fixing this point mm -hmm. so yeah so it's basically moving from a just plain endoscopy to endoscopic t lifts 
and i really want to know the funda behind it i mean in your experience uh i still uh, remember the teaching of my boss i am trained uh, with her dr ganchoy at uh, pohang viral hospital for entire one year each day during our morning session and morning class my boss used to tell if you want to do a fusion do it deliberately don't go for endoscopy <laughs> but nowadays you could see the trend shifting uh, from open uh, uh, tilips uh, to percutaneous and endoscopic uh, tilips but uh, in in other ways uh, i don't uh, consider it as a complete and a very uh, solid uh, fusion because uh, anyway you have to convert and uh, shift the patient uh, most of uh, the endoscopic surgeons in germany they do it in lateral position in south korea they do it in prone position so germans they shift a um, position of patient from lateral uh, to prone and then they do percutaneous uh, uh, screw fixation for those patients though they are uh, placing the cage through endoscope joymax has come up with a very good endoscope in which uh, there is incision of uh, hardly 12 mm 10 mm is the size of the scope through which working channel is 8 mm and through that 8 mm of channel you can uh, imagine how big the cage is and it's good for asian population the asian patients who are thin whose uh, diameter of the intervertebral uh, sorry the, the end plate is less in those patients you can put maximum two uh, uh, cages but those cages you have to prefill with the help of synthetic bone graft see we don't have any choice to take out the cancellous bone put it in the cage and then put that cage into the intervertebral disc so that's a limitation whereas i would say if you have if you are going up for the fusion go for mini uh, tilif what uh, dr aish sir is using nowadays yeah okay uh, so let's move on to the last case uh, i want help from dr ayush dr kedar to help me uh, uh, for this presentation yeah sure ravish so yeah so 67 year male farmer uh, who was having mild chronic low back pain for more than a year he developed a uh, sudden onset right anterior thigh uh, right I, i think there's a mistake right anterior thigh pain and it started after lifting heavy weight and you can see the distribution it's classically not radiating below knee and the patient had severe pain his activities of daily living were affected and he was not able to sit stand walk there was no fever uh, weight loss or rest pain and his uh, it was very difficult to move his uh, right lower limb sla was positive femoral nerve stretch test was positive and uh, hip range of motion was normal knee range of motion normal and uh, the motor weakness corresponded to third myotomal dermatome in lumbar spine uh, my, myotomal level in the lumbar spine and x rays you can see there is no significant instability and uh, this is the um, a sagittal view any quick comments uh, dr ayush uh, so something happening here uh, on the right i think these are On the right, the right side there is a weakness, I think so, and there is a yes. right side is some uh, uh, there is some a small disc which is going into the foramen on the parasteral cut. Yes, that is what I can see. Central it looks very good. Uh, I can and uh, left uh, I think is uh, okay, but there is small disc on the right parasteral cut. I think could be the culprit here, but I like to see yes. the other cuts. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this patient was actually referred to me for L45 grade one listhesis and some disc bulge at 45. But as uh, Dr. Ayush rightly pointed out, the pathology lies at L34, not at L45. If we see subsequent images, uh, we can clearly see that there is an extra foraminal disc herniation, which is on the right side. Uh, the red arrow shows the extra foraminal disc, and the green arrow shows the normal root. So uh, this was apparently was missed, but. Uh, anyways uh, so the patient presented with this and uh, extra foraminal disc herniation is most frequently missed disc type of disc herniation and uh, so it's very important to have a cursory look at the mri you know when when you are not able to find the cause of an unrelating leg pain it at higher lumbar levels it may not be radiating down all the way to your ankle or toes like that usually happens with a l45 l5 s1 disc so it's very important to keep this as a differential diagnosis in mind when the leg pain is not resolving and uh, so now this is the case so uh, obviously as with uh, uh, ordinary disc herniation we have all the options available conservative discectomy uh, conservative options discectomies and fusions one important point that i want to point out is that you know uh, many surgeons say approach uh, this extra foramen disc with a midline approach which i must say that it's outdated now 
and uh, it has problems that we'll discuss in the next slide. So conservative treatment was done for this patient. The patient had conservative care. He had transforamil epidural injection by pain specialist, and there was no further improvement. And uh, so uh, why I say that midline is not proper because when you have a paracentral disc herniation, you can do a laminectomy or laminoforaminotomy, and you are directly at the disc. But when you are doing, when you are dealing with an extra foraminal disc, and you try to grow from the midline, then you end up uh, damaging the facet, and you end up fusing it actually. So it is wiser to go from outside through a Wilsey approach. Now this has been traditionally done with an open technique, and nowadays uh, it can be done with an MIS technique and even with an endoscopic technique, as Dr. Bhushan mentioned. So it is important to understand that uh, if you want to migrate from open to MIS to endoscopy. Obviously, there are a lot of advantages. There is a reduction in surgical invasiveness, uh, blood loss is less, incision is small, and patients they go home the same day or the next day. But it is important to know that there is an increase in learning curve. Uh, all these newer techniques they they require some amount of uh, some amount of learning before you can you know use it widely for different variety of cases. So patient selection is very important in initial cases. And third is that when you want to opt for MIS, it is very important to have specialized training, specialized equipment, without without which all these surgeries are not possible. So I would say that for an orthopedic surgeon who is doing an open Wilsey approach, the next best thing to do is to do an MIS uh, Wilsey approach discectomy because there is just a slight uh, technical advancement compared to an open technique, but not as as uh, comprehensive. It doesn't require a comprehensive setup or a training as endoscopy. And uh, so I'll be talking about how to do an MIS extra foraminal discectomy. There are six, six simple steps for this surgery. So first is the incision. Uh, we classically take two centimeter lateral incision from the midline. You can mark it on the CM. It is at the lateral edge of the pedicle. And uh, after putting the incision, you have to pass the sequential dilators in such a way that when you uh, when you insert your tube finally, it should visualize the uh lateral half of the facet in the medial aspect of the tube so that placement is important you can dock it on the transverse process that is not uh, that, that that is also okay but you have to visualize the lateral aspect of the facet joint in the tube uh after it is docked you can uh, this this surgery is usually done with the help of a microscope uh, because visualization is very important if you if you don't have a microscope you want to use a loop you can use a bigger tube you can go up to 25 or 28 29 uh, that is fine. And uh, so the next thing is to identify the safe zone. So for extra phenomenal disc surgery, you know, it's very important to, you know, locate yourself, you get oriented in during the surgery very well. You just have to bite two to three millimeter of the lateral edge of the bone, just above the superior articular process. And maybe you have to remove one to two mm of this uh, superior articular process as well. So this is the safe zone. Make sure that you don't go higher up in the pars region, and you, you don't end up, you know, in uh, making this level unstable. So exactly, precisely two to three millimeter uh, lateral aspect of the uh, lamina, and or, or maybe uh, or just about one to two millimeter of superior articular process needs to be excised. So once you are done, you will identify a lateral edge of the ligamentum flavum. And when you remove, when you bite this flame, you will encounter fat pads. So that will tell you that you are exactly in the epidural space. And uh, once you are in the epidural space, you can pass a hook and you can identify, you can look for the nerve roots. And the things become pretty much easier once you cut this lateral edge of the ligamentum flavor. So the trick in this surgery is to remain inferior, inferior in this space. Because usually the disc herniation will push the nerve root superiorly, or it will push a nerve root posteriorly. Very less like less likely that it will push the nerve root inferiorly. So this is the safe zone, and you just try to be as close to superior articular process as much as possible, and while dealing in the ex epidural space, and then you will be able to identify root and the disc herniation as well. So uh, the space is very narrow, so you won't be able to pass on your big big uh, nerve root retractors. The only thing that can be passed on is easily will be a hook. So that hook can be used to retract the nerve root superior laterally, and you can identify the disc herniation, cut it, and then you can take out the fragment uh, with a with a small scar. So of course the patient will be able to walk easily the next day or maybe on the same day because uh, this foraminal uh, disc herniations they are very painful. 
and uh, the patients they have uh, dramatic uh, results after removing such herniation so similar case 35 year male chauffeur having uh, similar symptoms but this time on the left side and uh, it again started after lifting heavy weight uh, a femoral nerve test test was positive so in higher lumbar disc usually it is not the slr that is positive but it is a femoral so hip extension uh, you try to do hip extension that will be more painful so that will cause the stretch on the femoral nerves and uh, so yeah th so this is very important you can see it is very difficult you know if you if you would you know have if you are having 100 200 patients opd and you are just uh, you know quickly going through the mri you can easily miss this this is the extra foraminal disc and this is the normal route this patient had also undergone a transforaminal injection but had no relief so it is very important to identify otherwise you know you may miss this finding and this patient also underwent a similar extra foraminal discectomy and uh, uh, the scar is very small patients are happy but yes they should be cautioned about re recurrence and they should be given um, you know proper advices for 3 to 4 months so uh, if you look at the literature you know nowadays what has happened is that this mis extra foraminal discectomy is becoming the new gold standard for this uh, extra foraminal disc herniations because it has advantage of conventional open muscle splitting approach and at the same time the benefit of an endoscopic approach with, with, uh, that is smaller incision faster recovery and the technique is relatively easy definitely it has a learning curve but is less than that of an endoscopy and uh, of course dr bhushan can do this case with endoscopy as well but uh, i would say that uh, you know one has to be careful because sometimes the anatomy of cambin strangle is not favorable you know for uh, for uh, in, especially in asian population because they have a as as dr bhushan pointed out that they have they don't have a tall disc and sometimes you may not be able to you know negotiate a larger scope but uh, yes it can be done with an endoscopy as well but i would still uh, feel that Uh, this mis extrapolar discectomy will have less potential complications as observed by this study which is published you know few days back so the take home message is identification of extra foraminal disc herniation is important and it is frequently missed so whenever you have a patient with an unrelenting leg pain think of an extra foraminal disc herniation uh, the ideal treatment is to go paraspinal either you do it with open or will say and transforaminal endoscopy discectomy can also give you equal results thank you thank you ravish very nice presentation and very nice demonstration of transforaminal disc herniation over to you for uh, open discussion okay yeah, do uh, next yeah dr kida any question yeah one question to you i think uh, these are wonderful cases to start off ravish with uh, transforaminal so i think the next case that you get i think you should put your transforaminal scope in <laughs> <laughs> so and uh, the very important uh, message i think which is also important is you must know your anatomy very well uh, before you attempt all these mis and endoscopic spine surgeries so you must be a good uh, open surgeon first and um, you know that is the traditional gold gold standard uh, uh, you know still which is valid today and then go for uh, the mis and endoscopic because it is not about uh, telling that i am an endoscopic or a mis surgeon it's all about what you what results you give to the patient so it is very important uh, as especially for beginners i think uh, it's very important that you have you know uh, good open uh, spine surgery exposure uh, and then slowly and gradually shift to mis yeah. okay absolutely yeah uh, dr bhushan yeah um ravi your case is wonderful in this case there is one tip in which you can use preoperative mri scan of the patient and ct scan of the patient in which you can get accurate and exact measurements of the foramen and extra foraminal structures you can even see where the dorsal root ganglion is lying and what is the course of your exiting nerve root if you get these dimensions then putting in endoscope is very easy in this case you don't have to work much like what you do in valsi approach because your guide wire will directly land on the disc which is directly visible in endoscope if you are using even a zero degree of scope if you like you said you have to use microscope if you don't uh, you have to use microscope or loop in those cases i would say you can put a zero degree scope which we use for arthroscopy like uh, for knee joint you can put 30 degree scope which we use in knee joint and you can do the procedure it's very easy so the take home message in this uh, kind of cases you don't have to drill superior articular facet of inferior vertebra you don't have uh, to drill the lamina of that vertebra as well because you will be directly on the disc just take out that fragment and your job is done 
Okay, uh, so that's so uh, very. Yeah, so so in the, this case is uh, because the the exiting route is post so because good. the disc per se. Do you find it difficult when you are putting the scope? Is it a risk because you know you uh, the Campbell triangle is smaller here, and, and or do you go for then uh, inside out technique which you guys do first uh, do or no no this is a very good uh, uh, class. Please go ahead, Bhushan. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, sir. Uh, this is a very good set of uh, patients in which we don't have uh, to really worry much about uh, exiting nerve root because exiting nerve root, if, if you consider this as a fragment and this as exiting nerve root, your exiting nerve root has already been pushed up because of the disc fragment. So what you could see in endoscopic view or vision is the disc material only. You can very well uh, locate what is disc material and what is the nerve with the help of indigo garment, which we use. So that's why I use discography in each and every case. So you can very well identify the extruded disc material and you don't touch accidentally the nerve root or dorsal root ganglion. So I, I, I do believe these are very good cases for endoscopy. And yes. they are better, you can give better results than a tumor. You don't have to worry about yes. the dimensions of foramen because you are playing everything extra foraminally. You have I, I do completely believe that there are few cases where a endoscopy can do a better job than a tubular system, and this is one of them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, uh, but but yeah, the most important message is that you know this extra foramen disc herniations are common in elderly patient, and uh, we should avoid fusion in such patients because they have problems of osteoporosis, adjacent segment pathology. So whether to do it with endoscope or a transforaminal uh, or uh, with the help of a uh, tubes. It is the bottom line should be we should avoid a midline approach and we should avoid fusing such cases, you know, just just to approach that uh, pathology. So one question to Dr. Bhushan, uh, suppose if an orthopedic sur surgeon wants to start, uh, he does, he has an uh, knowledge of open disc uh, surgeries and he wants to start endoscopic uh, discectomies. Now, I understand that you mentioned that he should start with an annuloplasty, nucleoplasty. Okay, so after, okay, suppose he has gone through that phase. Now, what precautions, you know, in his initial learning curve should he take to do, uh, what kind of patient selection he should have? Like what kind of cases he should select as his initial 30 cases? In terms of location of disc herniation, in terms of uh, the age of the patient, the position of the iliac crest, uh, what are your, you know, pearls that you would give to an orthopedic surgeon? Who wants to, you know, don't get into trouble in, in his initial 30 cases. Yeah, exactly. You have uh, to see, as I said, and I uh, commented before also, you have uh, to select cases at level of L4-5 and L3-4 to max because L5-1 will be a difficult case to start with until and unless it's interlaminar and a clear-cut para uh, central disc herniation. Okay, so select a case at the level of L4-5 simple disc bulge in which there is no high, high iliac crest. Removal uh, or exclusion of high level iliac crest is very easy. It, it's done at uh, with the help of digital x-rays, APV, and you can see the direction of your endoscope and guide wire. You can uh, do it on your own screen and just try and uh, find, uh, sorry, uh, calculate the angle of your endoscope and you can uh, get through. I think to start with L4-5, simple disc bulge is the good case to start with. Okay. Okay. Uh, one more question to you, Dr. Bhushan. Uh, there are, like, suppose if you are doing an endoscopic surgery, we most of the surgeries are done under local anesthesia and the patient is not tolerating, you know, that local anesthesia. So what are the options, you know, that you have? Uh, do you give a GA, sedation or an epidural block? What are the other you know, things that we can do? See, uh, in the steps of endoscopy, like when we do local anesthesia, like we uh, numb the skin first, we go deep, we go deep, and we reach the level of uh, foramen. In foramen also, we inject around 1 to 2 ml of local anesthetic. We enter in the epidural space and we give the epidural block, which takes a care of a pain arising from the dense plexus of, of the epidural space. 
Again, if patient is not uh, tolerating the bone work, what we do in transpedicular endoscopy, sometimes we have uh, to drill the facet as well. Sometimes we have to drill the pedicle outer cortex also in order to make a room and enter in the canal. So in such a cases, you can use deliberately midazolam and fentanyl. So again, it depends upon the patient's fitness and anesthetist will take a call. Okay, uh, Dr. Ashwin Mehta sir, would you like to uh, ask any question? Any complications of injecting dye in the disc space? Anaphylaxis or anything of that sort? Yeah, uh, it, it is a saying that you should not uh, touch the disc if you feel that there is no need of or doing a discography, avoid it. If you are not confident in order uh, to differentiate which is a normal uh, disc tissue and which is extruded and degenerate uh, tissue, then in that case only you use uh, discography and indigo garment dye. Okay. Otherwise, there are adverse effects of using indigo garment dye and I personally don't advise to use it each and every time. The take-home message for this is use discography in your initial cases until and uh, till the moment you uh, build confidence to differentiate between normal tissue, neural tissue and a degenerate or extruded disc tissue. Okay. Thank you. Bhushan, is uh, indigo carmine available here in India? <laughs> no. You have to literally smuggle it and ask uh, somebody else. If you are coming from South Korea, please bring something. Get some indigo carmine on <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. What about methylene blue? Some guys are doing methylene blue as well. That's what I saw. It's, it's, it's not radio opaque, I think. Uh, with, no, no. Uh, uh, I would say methylene blue, you could with the help of Omnipack. Use Omnipack. But only thing is that you have uh, to correlate between fluoroscopic image and direct endoscopic image. Endoscopic image will show methylene blue stain and fluoroscopic image will show the Omnipack. So you have to really correlate and uh, go in and work. Okay. Methylene blue is also a good option in Indian set. Okay. Uh, I think we will conclude with this. Uh, yeah. Any closing remarks, uh, Dr. Bhushan? Uh, <laughs> closing remarks? Any any anybody who wants to start endoscopy, what 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 advice will you give regarding uh, you know having proper equipment, proper tools, radio frequency bar, or, or what what are your uh, thoughts about that? So you have to have a proper training. Like uh, you should uh, know in and out about the anatomy. You should have uh, done open procedures before, or not percutaneous procedures, microscopic procedures first, and then only you can land up uh, doing endoscopic procedures. During your training, you should uh, get the exposure uh, to uh, reading of MRI scans, CT scans, and X-rays because that is the only thing which will give you complete idea and that will build your confidence whether you will be able to land up in the disc and because it's all targeted work. You have to go and target the pathology and take it out. Otherwise, you will be in suit. So these are all uh, common uh, things which you have uh, to see during building your career in endoscopic spine surgery. Rest all instruments and equipments, number of uh, companies, they are coming up. Standard is uh, Richard Wolf. Next is uh, South Korean, the doctor's uh, endoscopic set, which I use. I bought it and I purchased it from my boss from Wordle Hospital. And the rest of the companies are Chinese. Few handful of the sets are uh, from Germany. So you can use any of those. I would suggest Richard Wolf is good to start with. Okay. Uh, one uh, last question to Dr. Ayush. Yeah, so uh, uh, there are there is a recent uh, literature, um, you know, uh, which says that uh, this extra foraminal and foraminal disc they are difficult to visualize with a conventional sagittal and axial images. So, and they have recommended taking oblique images. How frequently do you take? Do you take uh, oblique images in in your practice, or uh, you you are happy with the conventional sagittal and axial images? So normally we don't take it, uh, and we, we what we do. Is, what we do is, if you find anything difficult, we go back to packs. And you, with packs are so. What happens in when you see the MRI films, you might miss few of them, okay? Because the, they might not be that great. The other thing is, we make sure we get a three Tesla MRI. So that is more detailed. Three Tesla means you'll get much finer cut. The chances that you'll miss with a three, even with the conventional view, and uh, with with the three Tesla MRI. You that that is less. So what I suggest is very difficult to go for special cuts and everything. But what you need to do is read your MRI very carefully. If you have a doubt, go to the packs. Go and see each and every level and collaborate it. If you have a three text MRI, that gives you some 
slightly better treated so that is what uh, we do in our practice and uh, yeah, i think to add on to that ayush i think uh, you should also read t1 axials yeah, yeah all, the images, yes. all the images all the images we can list everything that is very important give some time to your images and if you as you do you you will be like you don't have to go for all your cases to your packs but few cases for sure something like this there is a doubt better go to your packs can i say something yes dr bhushan yes yeah um, in our center uh, of uh, pohang viridal uh, spine uh, they used to take a 45 degree oblique views which includes a uh, foraminal uh, uh, dimensions it, it gives you a clear cut idea of the disc position and the adjacent exiting nerve root but in indian setup you can use the coronal sections which uh, normally radiologists they give with the help of your mri images you just have to go <laughs> zoom in go along the sequences zoom in and see the adjacent nerve root you can get in the path you can clearly locate the pathology it's, it's easy okay okay so uh, thank you thank you dr ayush thank you dr kedar and thank you dr bhushan uh, dr ashish mehta sir your final comments final remarks excellent presentation lot of new things to learn <laughs> thank you all for being part of this uh, cme and thanks ravish for conducting it very well very well monitoring it thank you thank you now uh, shall i invite dr sejal to yeah. give his concluding remarks uh, uh, there during the talk talk <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay uh, good uh, thank you all and thank you particularly varun ayush and uh, bhushan kedar and uh, ravin for the nice discussion on the endoscopy and the minimal invasive and from on behalf of baroda orthopedic as president of baroda orthopedic thank you all for a wonderful session and thanks a lot and have a nice day thank you j and j also for sponsoring this session thank you a lot thank, thank you, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, thank you thank you thank you